So last time um, was a bit of a while ago uh, because the holidays were here and um, I initially made a video and then I decided I didn't like it. So um, I want to talk a little bit today about the academic bias and how it can have a negative impact um, on society at large um, and why and how we can see the academic bias when it comes to the authorship of the Gospels and the interpretation of the Gospels. So um, to begin the academic bias, well my career as a professor, okay, has been basically uh, based on my challenging of the academic bias that exists um, when it comes to language learning. Um, I moved to Italy when I was doing my postgrad out of college and um, I came here with a lot of the wrong ideas about language learning. People had initially told me that I would learn Italian uh, in like a month, right? Because people assume if you go to live in another country, you just sort of automatically learn a language without studying any grammar and just conversing with people. Um, obviously, that isn't true. And when I started having problems um, learning Italian, I thought there was something wrong with me and I was very discouraged. Um, then, of course, the second bias that we have uh, based on studies, based on research, because both of these things are based on research, um, is the bias of thinking that only children can really learn to speak a language well. And if you haven't started learning a language uh, before the age of 10 or 11, you can never really be as fluent as a native. Um, so when I started having problems learning Italian, I just assumed that part of the problem was that I was, you know, in my early 20s and it was too late for me to learn a language. Well, again, all of this is based on um, some studies about the way children learn, okay? And those things are good and useful because children spend the first five, six, seven years of their lives learning everything about the world and one of the most important components that they learn um, is language. But um, it's incorrect to assume that children uh, learn language faster or can acquire a new language faster than adults. Um, it takes, if you think about your own life, or if you've ever spoken to someone who's like five or six years old, you can understand that their language skills, yes, they can speak, but their language skills are very different from the language skills of an adult. And um, in my experience, an adult can learn a new language if they are dedicating um, most of their time to learning that language if they move abroad and they do study grammar, uh, reading, writing, conversation, if they're dedicating most of their time to learning a language, uh, an adult can learn a new language in about two years and become pretty fluent. Um, you might have some accent uh, because of the way that uh, the muscles in our mouths form when we're children, um, but you can be almost as fluent as a native in between two to three years, okay? Um, and if, you're, if you really work at it, you can become very fluent, maybe not as fluent as a native, but very fluent in about 18 months. That's actually what it took me. But of course, I had to get through all of those incorrect ideas that I had about learning a language. And then when I started teaching English to Italians, I found that it wasn't just uh, my personal problem, but that adults as a whole are influenced by these wrong ideas that we have and many adults become very discouraged um, and they think they can't learn a language. And people are actually making quite a bit of money out of spreading uh, the wrong information about the way that we learn language. A lot of people um, are promoting courses out there where they say you don't have to study grammar. You can just speak to people. Well, there are tons of schools that make money off of this, but that's not actually the way we learn language. And um, I became so good at teaching adults that I eventually got called to work in the universities. Um, and I started working with translation. I was an interpreter. Um, basically debunking the academic bias about language learning um, 
made a career for me here in Italy. Now, again, this is to give you an idea of um, how academic bias can be harmful. And it's not just here, right? We also have, for example, um, historical places where we can see that the so-called experts were incorrect, right? If we look over at um, the discovery of Troy, for years, um, archaeologists and scholars just assumed that the city of Troy was a fictitious city uh, made up by Homer uh, for his Iliad. But um, in 1868, Calvert and uh, Schleiman discovered the site of the city of Troy. Now, actually, they were incorrect about the level that they identified as being the city of Troy from Homer's Iliad, but still, the site is now assumed to be the site of where the city of Troy was. The same is true for Carter's discovery of the tomb of King Tut. Um, the experts were just convinced that the Valley of the Kings didn't have any other tombs left in it, and certainly King Tut, who was not really all that important of a pharaoh um, in the history of ancient Egypt, they just assumed that this particular tomb would never be found. And yet in 1922, Carter found that particular tomb. Um, another example of this is, for example, Margaret Mead's research. Um, her research, of course, it's hotly debated still today about the way that society impacts gender. But she was basically led by her own bias when she was talking about Samoa and their ideas about sexuality and women. Um, her, her intentions were good, okay? But unfortunately, because of her bias, she didn't look at evidence that could be used against her ideas. And there are some, like Freeman, but also other, other anthropologists today, really feel that the current data that we have about sexual assault in these countries does not support Mead's ideas of a sort of utopia uh, for the female gender and the equality between men and women. Um, I could go on and on. Again, the studies that I used in my first video about apologetics, the fact that so many um, researchers are trying to use studies to say that Christians are just less intelligent than atheists. Um, these are all studies that contain an, enorm an enormous amount of bias in, in the interpretation of data. So the researchers are focusing on data that upholds their hypothesis and they're ignoring the data that doesn't. Um, and the list goes on and on. I mean, if we think about the fact that there were atrocious ideas about race and about gender, um, even in the fairly recent past, even about 100 years ago, you still had these archaic, very wrong ideas that so-called experts held about race and gender. Um, so we really have to be careful about how we interpret data, even if we're not interpreting data in the wrong way on purpose, okay? So for example, let's take um, the a hypothetical example of a coroner that does uh, an autopsy on a person and they look at the contents of the stomach and in the stomach they're able to identify that about four or five hours before the death of this person they ate uh, a variety of different fruits so a banana an apple some blueberries some strawberries um, and they also identify maybe sugar content in the stomach. So they come to the conclusion that this person before they died ate a fruit salad because most of us, when we eat all of those fruits mixed together, okay, we would generally eat them in a fruit salad, right? With a little bit of sugar and other things. But maybe this person doesn't like fruit salads. Maybe they ate all of that fruit before they died just separately because they don't like mixing all the fruits together. Um, again, it's not that the data was wrong, but going back into the past, based on the evidence that you have, you can only say, well, I identified these different kinds of fruit in the stomach of this person. Um, not necessarily um, what that means. And the same thing is sort of true 
of archaeology and anthropology. We can look at the data from a certain site. We can look at the data from a certain text. But because we don't have a video of what actually happened, we have to draw conclusions. And sometimes those conclusions can be based on logic, based on good data, but they can still be wrong. So let's talk a little bit about the academic criticism of biblical authorship, which was what my last video was about, right? Um, and I had a comment from uh, a well-meaning viewer, and I appreciate the comments, and I appreciate uh, any sort of following. I appreciate that more than you know. But at the same time, this person had a fixed idea, right? And as many times as I said, well, let's look at this, um, let's look at this scholar, and let's look at this scholar, let's look at this other researcher. This person continued to say to me, oh, well, I don't believe that one, I don't believe that one, until they did research on, for example, Bart Ehrman, um, who is an atheist. And so if you, in this person's opinion, if you have a scholar that is critical of Bible authorship, like for example, Professor Martin or Professor Ehrman, okay, that before really commenting with me, he apparently did not know. Well, that person's okay, I trust that research, okay? But if we have, for example, another scholar of Bible authorship like Wallace or um, an apologist like uh, Dr. Craig, oh, I don't trust them because they're Christians. Well. Again, that shows a certain bias. What we have to do, whether it's uh, a Christian studying atheist thought or an atheist studying Christian thought, we have to set aside our conceptions, right? As much as we can. Obviously, you can never do that 100%. And look at what the actual data says and try to come to our own conclusions after doing our own research. So don't listen to me, okay? Don't listen to all of the other experts out there, do your own research of all of the different studies that are there and then come to your own conclusion, okay? Unfortunately, this is something that happens both um, amongst agnostics and atheists and Christians is that we listen to the experts, right? But we're not actually doing the research ourselves. We're trusting what other people are telling us and what other people tell us, that's their conclusions about the data. So we need to look at the data and then evaluate if their conclusions line up with what the data says. So let's look at this academic bias for the authorship of the Gospels. Now, what you need to understand is that the canon as we know it right now was not decided at the Council of Nicaea, as I said in a previous video, right? Council of Nicaea really looked at the concept of the Trinity. Okay, and I've already discussed that, so I'm going to leave it here for reasons of time. We know more or less that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were accepted as canon by around the year 120 uh, AD, or Common Era, based on how you look at uh, the time periods. Um, and we know this because of writings from the church fathers, so the, the first big leaders within the church. We also know this from um, outside evidence like the Moratorian Fragment, which most uh, scholars will date back to 170 AD. And we know that most of the canon as we see today, with the exception of a few of the letters, okay, was already fixed by 170 AD. Okay, um, and so when we go through, we can see at the, after the Council of Nicaea, there was some doubt about some books of the Bible, but they were actually the epistles. And um, that is called the anti, oh gosh, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, the anti legemena <laughs> I think I said that right, but I'm not sure. Um, and, and basically what that means is disputed text. There were texts that were disputed in antiquity, but they were more of the letters. There was another gospel called the Gospel of the Hebrews, which I'm very excited uh, to, to look at. I'm gonna try and get my hands on it to read it for myself, uh, that many church fathers thought of as uh, a gospel, okay, that was then not included. Um, I'm going to analyze as to the reason that that was eventually kind of left out of uh, the Bible as we have it today. 
Um, but mostly uh, it was, uh, let's see, the revelation that was disputed, uh, the, the letter to the Hebrews that was disputed, because again, we don't know who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. Um, I believe the Apocalypse of Peter, which is not in the Gospels, um, there are different books that were disputed, but most of those are simply letters, okay? Again, the letters and Revelation, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So why is it that there are people today that are questioning Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John if the people that were alive when the apostles were still alive were not questioning this? Well, that kind of goes back to the way the church developed and, um, and the history of Europe. So we have to go back and understand that initially Christianity was an outlawed religion, not because Christianity itself was considered bad, but because Christians refused to pay homage to the other Roman gods, okay? They were exclusive to worshiping um, Yahweh and Christ, okay? Yahweh, the, the Trinity in and of itself, and no other gods, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as we know it today. So once Christianity was accepted, okay, and tolerated with the Edict of Milan in 313 Common Era, okay, by Constantine, that was tolerated, not the official religion, but tolerated, so no longer persecuted within the Roman Empire, most of the books were then, well, they were also translated before, but they circulated much more in both Greek and Latin. That's why we have so many copies in Latin. And of course, the church was basically established in Rome. That was kind of where the head of it was um, until the fall of Rome and even after the fall of Rome. Now, after the fall of Rome in 476 AD, okay, Christianity had spread with the Roman Empire because it eventually became the religion of Rome. Um, but when the Roman Empire fell apart, fewer people spoke Latin. You had the development of the Romance languages, right? So that's French, uh, which was influenced by the Franks. Um, Spanish, which was Latin that was then influenced by the Visigoths, okay? Um, or Ostrogoths. The Italian language, which was influenced by the Visigoths, I think. Visigoths and Ostrogoths, it was Visigoths. One of the two was in Spain, the other one was in Italy, okay? Um, the English language that then, that then slowly developed because it was sort of a Germanic um, dialect for a while, but you had all these different languages that then formed out of Latin, but they were not Latin. So normal people no longer spoke Latin and it was no longer a skill that everyone had to just read and write. Okay, basically people only knew how to read and write if they were in a monastery, if they were part of the clergy, or if they were part of the aristocracy. Um, now, of course, in, within monasteries, they copied the Bible in Latin. So we have all of these different handmade copies of the Bible in Latin from that period. Okay, it wasn't until the printing press with Gutenberg in 1436 that we got an actual printed Bible. Okay, but again, most people didn't know how to read and write, and therefore it was really only the upper class and the clergy itself that could read. And so the Bible was being interpreted only within the halls of the church and the aristocracy. Okay, so with Martin Luther, he promoted the idea with the Protestant uh, revolution that everyone should be able to read the Bible. So that's when we have in the 1500s, 1500s and 1600s, you have every single individual country translating the Bible into their language. That's how we get the King James Bible, right? It became important for all Christians to know how to read and interpret the Bible for themselves. This is the period in the 1600s onwards that we have this idea of criticism of authorship. Okay, as more and more people started to read the Bible, and actually reading the Bible is what created English literacy specifically, um, you find yourself with people, and especially scholars, uh, and quite from the Enlightenment on, um, when 
because of all of the persecution that the Catholic Church had done during the Inquisition. If you think back to my video on Giordano Bruno, if you think to uh, about Galileo Galilei, the witch hunts, um, because of that, there, there was a, a divide between science and religion, and, and Christianity was sort of seen as this enemy of science, which it, that's not really true, but that's the way it was seen, and that's the way that we sort of continue to see it today, despite the fact that most of uh, the people that pr promoted science in the 17 and 1800s on, they were Christians. I believe even Darwin himself um, was a man of faith. Uh, he just, again, that's a whole nother discussion there. Um, so you get a lot of Bible criticism that comes up in the 1600s with like um, Bacon and Descartes, uh, Richard Simon, um, and then you get into the 1700s and 1800s and that's where you get examples uh, of Bible critics um, like uh, the, the German school itself, um, like uh, Eckermann, and uh, Hecker in the late 1700s, and it moves into the 1800s where you get all of these different um, scholars that sort of have a bias against the validity of uh, the biblical text, especially, you know, like Genesis, right? The, the creation story. Um, and they begin to really attack the Bible based on authorship. Um, but again, in antiquity, the people that were alive at the time were not criticizing the authorship. They had no reason to doubt that Matthew was written by Matthew, Mark was written by Mark, Luke was written by Luke, and John was written by John, okay? We only start seeing real criticism of the authorship in the modern era. And to me, that tells me a lot. Now, we can look to the text, um, we can look to outside sources, um, this can be widely discussed, and as I said, every single person needs to do their own research on this, not just listen to me. Look it up for yourself. Um, I strongly encourage that, um, but that's because I'm very confident, um, because I've done my own research. I am very sure that if you start looking into it, and you look into both sides, not just the academics that agree with you, you'll find that the academics that make a case for the authorship being the authorship that we classically and traditionally assign to these books. I believe the case is much stronger for the traditional theory of authorship rather than this idea that these books were written by other people that then put these names onto them. Okay, um, and I'm going to stop here because I'm already at well over 22 minutes. Um, next time I'm going to talk a little bit again uh, about this theory of the Q document and the Gospel of Thomas and why I believe that the Q document doesn't exist and why I believe that uh, the Gospel of Thomas is certainly not to be considered an actual gospel. Interesting, it's an interesting little document, but it's not what I would consider an actual reliable gospel. Um, and until then, have a wonderful week. God bless.